I still have no idea how to intro these videos, meaning that it's a new episode of the new show. Welcome back everybody, and I hope that January treated you guys well. I've been doing good, I got a new chunky video out and have been celebrating with Hi-Fi Rush, which is fantastic. But that aside, it was an eventful month for anime, which I'm noticing is the usual for January. We got new anime, licensing updates, an award show to talk about, and much more. A little bit of everything today, and like always, we're going to be going through all of that on the first anime recap of 2023. Let's go. New Year, same old start off with the licensing block, and the best kind with a new Discotheque Direct that came at the end of the month. I got a note that stated by the guys, this is more of an in-between one, so nothing crazy, but still some good stuff to talk about. Starting with Magic Girl Lyrical Nonoha Reflection, the first of two movies. I don't know much about this series itself, but from what I've looked into, it's been kind of forgotten post their original licensing company shutting down. Some of my viewers have been wanting it rehomed, and while this isn't exactly that, being the movie, it's a good sign, trust me. All they need is to get the ball rolling, and if it gets the momentum, the other entries in the franchise will follow suit. If you're thinking getting a movie first seems weird, it was probably easier to acquire since to my knowledge they weren't ever handled by anyone else. The same thing happened with Urasa Yatsura, starting off with the second movie, Beautiful Dreamer, in 2016, then making their way through the rest of them and eventually getting the original anime. Basically, you guys gotta wait, they got their foot through the door and now it's just baby steps and that's what matters. Speaking of the original green, the TV anime is gonna be dropping in April. Still don't know how many episodes in the release, but I'm dying to get this one. Next up, good old retro anime with Iria Theorem the Animation. This being the first Blu-ray of it in the entire world, and it's gonna be looking real good since there are new 2K film scans from the original negatives. I actually have the VHS of this one, and I've never been able to watch it, so def gonna pick this up when it drops since the world and designs are very much my jam. Let's wrap this up with an oldie but a goodie. Re-Cutie Honey is getting a Blu-ray release thanks to Astro Res, being a unique upscaler they use a lot. It's better than the usual, and I explain it so much that I'm tired of doing it. Aside from the crisp new picture, the three-episode OVA by Hideki Anno, Hiroki Amaishi, Naoyuki Ito, and Masayuki is also going to be getting a new English dub, with mainstay Jessica Calvello returning as the titular Honey. The rest of the cast is really cool, with them focusing on those who have been in any of the entries of the franchise. The packaging looking great, with them using any official art they can get their hands on and just stuffing it in there. Out of all the iterations, this one's been on the back burner for a while since the look has always been my fave, and when you have my boy Amaishi in there, I'm officially obligated to watch it. This one still has no release date, but being so early in the year, it'll def be out by the end of 2023. Reminder that these are just what I thought were the best announcements, so there's way more stuff I haven't talked about. From their tokusatsu, live action labeled, and of course anime. So if you want to see everything from the Direct, as well as previews for what I mentioned here, check out the full thread link below. Something quick you might have missed is that the upcoming Hell's Paradise anime is going to be co-streamed by Crunchyroll and Netflix. This was just flipped in at the end of the month with very little word from Crunchyroll for pretty obvious reasons. I only noticed this when looking through the Netflix Twitter and seeing all the retweets about the anime. This is def a recent development since Crunchyroll announced they acquired it back in November, with Netflix coming in a month later. I can totally see them giving an offer so good that the ones behind the anime couldn't just pass it up. Since it's really weird that this happened a month later instead of being announced all at once. And this has also never happened before. There's never been overlap for a new anime streaming on Netflix. So something dev happened behind the scenes. I just find it kind of funny that we're looping back to that era of multiple services just sharing an anime. Cause they were actively trying to avoid that for a few years and here we are again. CR Def isn't happy about this while Netflix doesn't mind since it'll bring more eyes on their ever bleeding service. It is nice to know this won't be in Netflix jail since Crunchyroll does know how to release anime. And it just means more eyes are gonna get on it, which is really good, I'm pretty sure no one's gonna have a problem with that. Next up, news that makes me really happy being that ZOM 100 Bucket List of the Dead is officially getting an anime for July. Aside from it leaking a whole week earlier than planned, how it's being handled should get you guys real excited. Which may seem like an odd ask since it's being done by a totally new studio, Bugs Films. Which I get, but guys, I got you. Let's go. 
To keep it real simple, think of Bugs Films as a new branch of OLM that was formed to handle more late night anime, like ZOM 100. In an OLM interview about summertime rendering, someone noticed some pretty familiar manga in the back shelf, and this was several months in advance. No, it's still a separate studio, it's just the easiest way to explain this. And with that in mind, the staff makes a lot of sense. This being Kazuki Kawagoe's follow-up to his directorial debut being both seasons of Komi-san. Hiroshi Seko doing series composition, who's done that with Doro Hedero, Mob Psycho, Summertime Rendering, and a ton of other stuff. With it being so far away, the trailer being so well animated, and using the colorful element that we see in the covers, get ready for the most insane group of survivors ever. It may seem like I skipped to a completely different section of the video, but the reason it's here is that it's been totally locked in by Viz Media. And no, I don't mean the usual like post-announcement, I mean they got the deal done before it was even announced. Revealing an official English Twitter at the same time as the Japanese one. Reminder that they had to announce it a week in advance because of all the leaks that were happening. This is huge, since Viz hasn't licensed a completely new anime in a few years, just going for legacy franchises. With CR, Netflix, and Disney making it really difficult, I would have assumed they were gonna bounce out of anime since they don't really need it, but I am very happy to be wrong. Showing an amazing trailer six months in advance and not letting anyone even attempt to license it is a massive power move. Especially after what's going on with Hell's Paradise, it's even more delicious. With an English Twitter and website, they're going all in. They're pretty much saying, yeah, it's that good. Snagging one of the biggest anime of the year before anyone else, they're very much sticking their flag into the ground and saying, yeah, we're back. The anime absence might have been them just retooling their business model to the new landscape. With Sentai doing the same thing, it looks like this transitional period we're in is gonna be ending real soon. And that's very exciting. It's too early to tell what their strategy is going to be unlike Sentai, but I'm def going to keep my eye on them. ZOM 100 will be out on Hulu in July. And maybe Toonami, I'm just going to call it right now. A weird one that I can't believe keeps making it on this show is Vidland Saga. Since last time we talked about how there are two dubs, one produced by Netflix and the other by Sentai. With season 2 here, you'd assume it would be the same thing as last time. No since it's now being handled by Crunchyroll who's doing their own dub of it. It gets weirder since there is some overlap with the Sentai one for a few of the characters. That part actually makes sense since they're now producing dubs in what used to be Funimation, Sentai being located in the same state of Texas. It's just kinda weird since it's implied some of the voices have changed like with the narrator. Uh yeah, there's now three English dubs for Vinland Saga. I don't know what to expect anymore, there's probably a fourth one that's gonna eventually pop up somewhere. CR dubs don't end there since we gotta talk about Trigun Stampede, with the first information about it being that Johnny Ambosh was returning to play Vash. And then after that they were really cagey about everyone else. Me and many others were assuming it was gonna be a Badland Rumble situation, and yep, that's exactly what happened. For some context, the original series came out in the 90s, with a movie releasing over a decade later, with Johnny being the only one that stayed. If I had a nickel for every time a new entry in Trigun replaced everybody except Johnny on Bosch, I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice. And I have a lot of problems with that when it comes to Stampede. I love Johnny Ambosh, he's one of my favorite voice actors, yet keeping him kind of implies that he was the main reason why the original dub was beloved. Which rubs me the wrong way since it wasn't just his Vash that made it good. It was also Jeff Nimoy's Wolfwood and Dorothy Fawn's Merrill. I just don't like it that these guys got shafted twice, I'm just saying. That aside, Studio Orange wanted to do a new take on Trigun. So to start as fresh as possible, the Japanese voice cast was completely new. They didn't want anything that could link it back to the original series, down to the voice actors. Johnny coming back kind of undermines that and just feels really hollow, cause it's clear they're just banking on everyone's nostalgia. But I do think there was a way to do this a lot better. It's really freaking simple, you should have gotten everyone else back. Trigun is legit comprised of three characters and the other two are both here. My point is that it's one of those things you can't half ass, you either have to full ass it or not do it at all because at least you're leaning all the way into the nostalgia element, and it's just less weird. This is a very different version of Vash from the original anime, so it would have made more sense to recast him, 
and I think there was a good alternative for this as well. A lot of you are not gonna like who I would have casted, but the few that know are gonna totally get where I'm going with this. Vash should have gone to Bryce Pappenbrook. Now that you're done disliking the video, let me explain my reasoning. I get that he has a really specific voice, and it's not for everyone, I get that. But casting him would have given Vash a new voice like he was supposed to, while cleverly being a passing of the torch that connects it to the original series. Because Bryce was young Vash in it. If you didn't know that, it's because he was actually a kid when he recorded that stuff. Johnny didn't even know about it until recently. ...that we were on together once. Um, it might have been Trigon. Oh, um, yeah, it had, had if you were in Trigon. Yeah, yeah, I got it. So I don't know if you know this, I play young Vash. <laughs> I put that in there since this part is going way too long and I need something fun to break it up. Okay, back to not fun. Meaning that on the surface level, there would be nothing connecting the two. His new seiyu is even Kirito and Inosuke. This is literally writing itself. Obviously, going for Bryce wouldn't have been a universal solution, but I feel like the fanbase would have been more open to the idea given the context. In the end, this is all for a dub, so it doesn't really matter. But what do you guys think about all of this? Are you going to check out the dub or stay with the sub? And what do you think about my idea? Leave some comments below because I love to go through them. This part's been going way too long, so let's finally get to the next story. The CR talk doesn't end there because of the anime awards. With the nominees being unveiled, I thought it'd be fun to look through them and give my thoughts. With the expected inclusions of Attack on Titan, Demon Slayer, and Spy Family for anime of the year. For best ending, I wouldn't mind if it goes to Dress Up Darling, Komi, or Call of the Night. Dress Up with its simplified and thick outline style with its pastel colors. It's what the term eye candy would look like. The song being what Cotton Candy would sound like if you could plug headphones into it. It's just really freaking cute and really well done. The Komi one with a lineless style and choppy animation. Allows for so much movement while making all the actions from the class so vivid. With the song, it just feels so intimate. Like you're a fly on the wall seeing the day to day of this classroom we're always watching. Just from a different perspective, removed from all the comedy. There's nothing wacky, just letting the visuals breathe with the music making it feel so delicate. There's a beauty in its simplicity like watching a moving painting. And yeah, it def earned its nom and I would hope from the three this one actually wins. And lastly, Call of the Night. Having the simplest visuals, but what really saves it is the song, completely nailing the urban nightlife feel. Just sounding like something you'd hear in a club. With so much energy like the party is now starting, which is accentuated with the colors. This one is a pretty great example of how a song can really carry an ending. Cause boy will it grow on you as you watch more episodes. In my opinion, these are some of the best representations of what endings can be when they're used as an opportunity. This is how I would order them from what I want to win the most. If I'm being honest, it's a pretty alright year with a nice amount of variety throughout. But how the hell wasn't Call of the Night nominated for Best Score and Director? Like for real, what? The OST is amazing in its subtlety and personality. It's so ambient and energetic like you're in a dream that you never want to wake up from. Yoshiaki Doa got snubbed so hard. Same for Tomoyuki Itamura, Call of the Night being one of the prettiest anime I've seen in a while with its use of color, lighting, a lot of other things I can talk about that I forgot it was even taking place at night. It easily became one of my faves from last year. It's so unique that it should be in more categories. Can we just swap out Edge Runners for all of its noms? Can we do that? No? Oh god damn it. If I'm being fair, not animation. Cause while there is that one dope moment, Edge Runners did way more. Another one I need to bring up, where the hell is Goodbye Donglees for best film? The franchise films were expected, but really the Deer King over Don Gleese? Really? Like really? Okay. For real, Deer King is the most wasted slot, and I'm quite certain the committee haven't seen it. And just went with it because of the director who had a history with Ghibli. Even though Don Gleese is way better. And maybe they just needed something to fill the slot and just didn't have a lot of options. Okay, then just get some of the movies that became accessible in 2022, like Pompo or Lady Nikako. Yeah, they came out in 2021, but it's not fair to disqualify them for something out of their control. When their actual lifespan is going to be the moment they release outside of Japan, which usually takes six months at minimum. Just look at Don Gleese and Deer King, that both came out in February. These exceptions would be a great way to expose them to a new audience that definitely missed them. And I'm so focused on this because a lot of Disney Plus anime became available in January and they'll most likely be dealt the same fate. 
so don't expect summertime rendering or time machine blues for next year. Going back to the actual nominees, my hope would be Inuo to win, being my favorite anime from last year. It was an amazing experience in the theater and def one of Yuasa's best. While I'm at it, here are my other fave anime films I saw last year if you're interested. But honestly, we all know it's gonna go to the franchise films. If you're not a well-known shonen, you're basically there to lose, and this just applies to the whole award show. I haven't seen all the anime nominated, so I'm gonna try to watch as many as possible before then, and I'll keep you guys updated with that little endeavor. Switching it up with an annoyance of a different kind, Netflix unveiled a new short film that was made in part by AI, and goddammit I hate everything. Wits being the studio behind it, so I'm more disappointed. Apparently they did it because of a labor shortage over there, as a way to ease up work, which is a garbage excuse. Cause there are a lot of animators looking for jobs, or, you know, you can just pay your animators more. I know it's a crazy idea that having a higher pay might get you more employees, but I think I'm onto something here. This becomes extra dumb when you learn... This becomes extra dumb when you learn that an artist made the layout, which would be then given to the AI, and what it made was so bad that the artist just had to draw over everything themselves. The definition of if it ain't broke, don't fix it. They added extra steps for no reason. The cherry on top being the credits, where it says AI plus human. The guy who had to fix all the backgrounds got no credit. 10 out of 10. This is more just to tell you guys not to watch this since we don't want this to become a trend. I personally don't think there's any value in art without the human element, and it just sucks to see that many don't get that. In general, it just looks really generic, so we're prob them it's not on anything. Okay, time for something fun. Y'all remember the live-action Bebop? Okay, bad way to start, but trust me with this. In a recent interview with Forbes, Shinichiro Watanabe actually gave his thoughts on it. Netflix sending him a review copy of the first episode where he dipped immediately. He didn't even make it past the casino. He very quickly knew it wasn't Bebop, which made it a very hard watch, which is really nice to hear, with the only good thing about it being that it made the anime better. A very nice amount of vindication for everyone who rightfully criticized it. The rest of the interview is worth a read. Talks about his history with Sunrise, how Bebop almost didn't happen, and how he wanted to punch a producer he was working with. A lot of good stuff. Like how 1984 was a really important year having Nasuka Valley of the Wind, Urusayatsu the Too Beautiful Dreamer, and Macross Do You Remember Love releasing, making him switch from wanting to do live action to anime. Beautiful Dreamer being his favorite from the three. Gonna link it below for anyone interested because it's very much worth your time. Switching gears again, it's been some time since the last episode of the new show. In that absence, someone else started their own, which I don't have a problem with, since everyone is going to cover different topics and it just means more information is going to be spread around and that's good. Like how he's talking about Snafu getting an OVA, which isn't my thing, but I'm glad he's talking about it. As long as there's an effort to not spread any wrong information, I'll be a happy camper. In this case, since Snafu has been traditionally released by what is now Crunchyroll, no to be fair, it's not easy information to find out who licensed Snafu, so I get why he made that mistake.
Okay, so with that in mind, let me give you my thoughts on the Snafu Ovier. The chances of it coming over here are actually much higher than you'd think. Sentai does a lot of re-releases of their catalog every few years. Snafu having three seasons, I can totally see them getting bundled in the future like what they did with Hayate the Combat Butler. If they got the OVA, it could bump up the price a bit. And again, they have an excuse to re-release every couple of years, so it does work out. But don't go expecting that, I'm just saying it's possible. Thankfully, this is the first and last licensing mistake he'll do, and I'll never have to cover him ever again. Time for some quick announcements before the wrap-up. We got a new original film from Studio 4C that's currently going by the name Future Kid Takara. They were actually running a Kickstarter to fund the pilot, and by the time this video is out, they will have finished having edged out its goal of 3 million yen. It's gonna be used to get more investors on it to turn it into a full movie. With a pretty solid staff behind it. Yuti Sano being the director, Shinji Kimura designing the characters and the world, and the writer being Yuya Takashima. It really feels like a passion project by the guys over there when you go through the Kickstarter page. Being set in a dystopian future that was ravaged by the effects of global warming. Something they've been thinking about for the last few years, and they want to show what that terrifying outcome can look like while trying to lower our own CO2 output in the process. They want to make a film to raise awareness on the issue, making it educational but still full of adventure. They're really serious about this having a climate documentarian as a project advisor and an environmental scientist being, well, the science advisor. There is a lot of dope concept art that reminds me of their short cannon fodder which I really dig. All the info on it will be linked below if you want to read more, and I'll def keep you guys updated on it since I'm always going to plug original anime on here. New adaptation coming in with the girl I like forgot her glasses getting an anime. I actually read this one for a bit and it'll nicely fill the gap Kubo-san will leave when it wraps. The title is as direct as it gets, so think of the intimate element from Kubo-san with the innocence of Takagi and just remove all the teasing and you get this manga. A lot of the cute moments happening because of the lack of eyesight and not because she likes the dude. Yet. Yeah. A good old wholesome time that'll make you vomit sugar when you see it. No date for it, but I'll keep my eye on it. The animated diabetes doesn't end there since we got a new trailer for my clueless first friend. A gloomy loner girl gets a stupid friend because of her nickname. Yes, I am that predictable and I will be watching this. And lastly, Skip and Loafer got a new trailer, the first being a teaser so this one shows a lot more of the anime. Okay, out of all the wholesome anime we've talked about, this is probs the one you should prioritize. All the trailers will be linked below. Time to end things on a nice note, as always. There was actually another crowdfunding campaign last month, and no it wasn't for a film or anything, it was for a piece of garbage snake girl, good old Jashin chan with the goal to fund the entire fourth season. The staff stating that to do a single core, 13 episodes, it would cost them around 300 million yen, which they can't raise since Jashin chan is pretty much a niche passion project at this point. So, for every 30 million raised, it would be another episode in production, capping off at 115 million yen. So, I hope it rounds out the four episodes. But in the process becoming applicable for the world record of most money raised for an anime project, beating the last holder by 20 million yen. And yeah, while it didn't get the whole season it wanted, I still got a massive soft spot for fans supporting the stuff they love, and also this weird little show. It's deaf not for everyone, trust me, but it's nice to know more of its charm is coming for those who love it. And with that is the end of the first episode of the year, what was your fave story? Give me your thoughts on the anime awards, and is there any new anime that catches your eye? Leave your comments below because I love to read them. But as always, bye guys, thanks for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video.